I forget to do that. All right. Now we're recording. You have two other people who are taking this course. Um, one is a gentleman over at St. X, and he's probably involved with something after school. And then the other is, got to forget, somebody here in Jefferson County. That's right. So, anyway, you want to get going here? Sounds good. Let's do it. So here it is. Uh, pretty much the structure is very straightforward. We've always worked this way. Uh, what I thought we could do tonight is just let me walk you through what we're going to do uh, and remind everybody, again, that we will not be meeting next Tuesday. I'll be out of town. Uh, but um, And we've also pointed out that this is not going to take the entire semester. So you can either look at that as I can hurry up and get this done, or I can do a few things, let it go, come back, because each one of the modules, what's nice about them is they're pretty much self-contained. So like this first module, this history of online learning, there is a quiz built in here. And I will warn you right now, the quiz is boring um, and it's kind of long-winded, deliberately so, because what we're trying to show you, uh, as well as give you some information, is the old way. And the old way was sit and get heavy text laden, read, 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 take a quiz, read, 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 take a quiz. And there's a better way. So don't let module one bum you out. It's not like it's going to be a, a precursor to what we're going to be doing. And the quiz will pop in to your grade center. Now, if you are a perfectionist and you need to have 100%, I've set it up so you can go back and retake the test until you get 100%. Because again, the old way was you got a score and then you had to live with that score. The new way is learning should be revisited and we should have a chance to go back and look at our errors and recorrect and correct them. So that'll be one. You can do that on your own. You don't need me. Module two is where I'll step back into the picture. Um, and we're going to be reading a lot in module two. Uh, this is a good friend of mine by the name of Terry Anderson. Uh, Terry teaches out in Vancouver, I think now. Yeah, he teaches out in Vancouver. He has a really good book uh, that I uh, first picked up, gosh, way back. And it's uh, called The Theory of Online Learning. It's a really good book because it really does a nice job of kind of weaving together history as well as reality of how it's done. It is heavy. It is heavy. It's very much a um, graduate school kind of read. Just be grateful I didn't make you go out and buy the whole book because, uh, yeah, it's a read. <laughs> and that's okay because we need that. The other pieces that are in Module 2 are paradigm shifts, constructivism, and inquiry-based learning. Basically, what we have here is online learning is a true paradigm shift. It's In other words, we're going back and starting over. But if we don't really go back and start over with what we think about teaching when we do an online class, then we really aren't changing anything. It's still the same old stuff. Um, we're just doing it by recording it or uh, people coming in and sitting and watching while some idiot talks to you. So the paradigm shifts, the thing to take away from that is a true paradigm shift must go back and start from zero. Uh, and when you view the videos that are in here, you'll see those discussions about what does a true paradigm shift look like. There are very few of them in education uh, because education is so heavily based on tradition, what we've always done, etc. cetera. Um, and online learning has been oversold, I think, as a true paradigm shift. Constructivist teaching has been around forever. John Abbott uh, out of Stanford. He's in here, too. Um, I am a very, very, very strong believer in constructivist teaching and learning. Um, this is called a theory, constructivist theory. I don't believe in it's a theory. I think it's real. I think it's the real deal. Um, hold on a second. Somebody just texted me and it's popping in. 
and they're saying they can't get to it, and I know why. So let me tell them why, Britt. Okay. So constructivism, um, and we'll, I'll spend a lot of time talking about it. Inquiry-based learning, again, been around for a long time. Um, and we, what we really believe in with this is that if we can get kids to own their own learning, kind of like in a Montessori classroom, you really can see some real growth. Because the thing we want to do is to teach kids to learn. We don't need kids putting in facts and spitting them back out at you. We need facts. We need fundamentals. But what we really need is for kids to apply that. Uh, you're going to create a voice thread here. We'll walk through what to do. Very straightforward, very easy. Uh, the voice thread is all set up and ready to go from inside this course. Don't worry. We'll hold hands and do that together. Here is probably the core of the course. Uh, the lift of the course. This is knowledge building principles. Um, I have been a part of this program, this uh, cult, <laughs> as we've been described. Um, it is based out of the University of Toronto uh, in their school of education. It was developed by two educational researchers, uh, Marlene Scardamilia and Carl Bereiter. Both who are Americans, actually, and they came from Stanford University. They came out of the same gene pool, if you want to describe it that way. They came out of the same group of scholars out there as John Abbott, the guy who came up with constructivism. Um, and they have developed this idea about knowledge building is a set of principles. They firmly believe that kids learn best by looking at their ideas and putting them to the test. And this kind of gets sometimes over exaggerated as to somehow kids are doing research. No, not really. What kids are doing is, is they're ba basically able to enunciate their understanding. I understand fractions to mean this, you know, that's simple. But if we could get kids to be able to sit there and say, this is what I understand, but this is what I don't understand, my God, our jobs would be so much simpler. So it's a lot of high, 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 high language in knowledge building, as you can see here from what it says. But it, what it really gets down to is helping kids understand their learning and to be able to talk about their learning. Uh, there are lots and lots of videos in this particular module uh, because you've got a lot of lifting to do here. And what I, the reason why I did this is because, first of all, these are all friends of mine. And I wanted you to hear from people. This is Richard Messina. These are the folks who have been involved in this for many, many, many many years like me we're all friends and one of the things that we wanted to do was to put the 12 principles of knowledge building into a way that real teachers could talk about it and explain it and so here they are we also decided what we wanted to do was to allow kids to have a chance to talk about it. Here's my kid, uh, not my biological kid. Here's the kid that I picked to talk about this that I own. I'm the one who wrote this one about epistemic agency. I'm a huge believer in epistemic agency, but I'm a huge believer in everything that's in here. What you're going to do with this is you're going to create your own voice thread, and you're going to use this document right here. And in this document, what it is contained in there are all the pieces that you need to do 
the voice thread. We'll hold hands and we'll walk through this together. So I don't just throw you to the wolves with this because I really want you to see um, what we can do with this. And what I'm going to ask you to do, well, I hope nobody gets uh, seasick watching me flip through these things. What I'm asking you to do here is to develop an online ebook presentation using VoiceThread with text, audio, and ABC and Word Cloud, pictures and videos illustrating KB principles. Your VoiceThread will convey the 12 principles outlined in the KB principles document and KB principles in the module. Your VoiceThread should define what each principle is in your own words, illuminate how you see the principles applied in the classroom, and describe a classroom activity that employs some of these principles. Now, let's flip back into the module. There you go. That document does that. So basically, all you're going to do, watch the videos, read this document, create your voice thread. Uh, we'll start it together. And you're going to then explain back to me how you understand how all this works. Here, I'll go ahead and click on it so you can see what it looks like. It took me a while to build this. But I felt like we really needed to have something to look at because a lot of this stuff gets kind of, you know, it gets a little too esoteric, I think, when it's really just straightforward ideas. So look at this document here. So the principle called Real Ideas, Authentic Problems, what it's talking about is how do you have learning take place in your classroom and have kids think about it in terms of real ideas and authentic problems. So much of what we do in school is we don't carry it over to a real problem or a real situation. The kids can kind of see, oh, I see how that fits. You know, the obvious easy one is you talk about fractions. Well, as soon as you start talking about fractions in terms of a pizza or in terms of a carton of eggs or in terms of cutting up a cake, it makes sense to kids. They can visualize it. They can see it. So you can see here that what it means is that knowledge problems arise from efforts to understand the world. Not typical end of chapter textbook problems. Problems drive learning, not just for practice after learning. So that would be what it means. You read that, you watch the video, reinterpret it, put it in your own words. Instructional tactics. Use activities that could simulate students' interest in the topic, guide them through generating questions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Roles of technology. Use a video to illustrate this. Possible obstacles on how to overcome it. What if students', students interests are not in the syllabus? Capture all students' ideas and help them to prioritize them. And then indicators to know when it's done. Students can relate to the problems, build on notes, indicate students' personal reflections. Every single one of the KB principles is done here. Um, there's my baby. Rather than rely upon the teacher's or tutor's cognitive authority, the participant takes responsibility for their own thinking and problem solving. Reciprocal teaching and learning. Students form groups, and in the spirit of the jigsaw gallery walk approach, each group leads a topic of discussion. Um, epistemic agency, I just really, really am strongly in belief of that, where we basically push back to kids and say, well, what do you think? Help me understand what you understand. You know, if you think about it, it's very similar to transactional analysis. You know, I hear what you're saying. So I don't want, I want to take away the fear of that particular module because a lot of people freak out when they see this and they go, I got to build a voice thread with 12 slides. You know, it's, it's just not something to freak out about. Let me pop back into that. And let's go look at the fourth module. Once we get done with this, we kind of leave theory behind. Um, what we're doing from here on out is we are going to be looking at it from the practice point of view. How do I now build something? Now that I've got this idea about what it should be as opposed to what it was, where do I go? Well, once again, it's very straightforward and simple. We have a guide. 
And this is what your final is based upon. And all you're going to do is learn this guide. And when you create your Google Classroom, it's just a fill in the blank. Let me show you what I mean. So this guide that we're going to use is something called Quality Matters. Quality Matters is the standard for developing online content. There is a Quality Matters for higher ed. And now there's a Quality Matters for K for 12. It's a rubric. Very straightforward. It's a, it is supposed to be a peer review process, faculty to faculty, for reviewing and improving online and blended courses. It is not supposed to be an evaluative instrument. So once again, when you do your final, what you are doing is you are going in and you're looking at what you've created. You're looking at what the standards are in QM, and then you are saying, yeah, I met this standard, and you score yourself. I come in behind you, and I look at what you've done, and your scoring and my scoring should match up. The fact that you do it is the grade. The fact that you see something in your online classroom that doesn't um, – register the grade that QM would give to it doesn't matter. Now, you can't go through and get all zeros, obviously, because that means you haven't done anything. But the fact that you have sat there and looked at what you've created and you go, you know, this one is worth a two, which means it's kind of important, but I don't think it's really all that important. I think it's just a one. And that's fine. You are the owner of your work. Uh, and here it is. Right here. Let me go ahead and pull it up so you can see it. It has eight standards. Whoa, you're not going to be able to see that. That's way too small. Let's see if I can bring that up. It has eight standards. Uh, and I really, when I found this, it just made so much sense to me. I just couldn't get over how it just really helps in my thinking. So here we go. So the first standard is course overview and introduction. Uh, instructions are made clear. There's a, there's a sort of, hi, I'm your instructor. Self-introduction by the instructor is appropriate and available online. Common sense, straightforward common sense. Here's your learning objectives. Well, yeah, okay. I think I better put that in there. Here's assessment capability. Here's instructional materials, what you put in for kids to use. Uh, learner interaction and engagement. This can all be done, in fact, sorry about that. This can all be done in one section. When you look at Google Classroom anyway, this can all be done. Uh, instructional materials, what you put in it. Learner interaction and engagement, this can all be done through the use of commenting inside of Google Classroom. Course technology, hello, I'm using course technology. But you might want to look at some of the tools that I've put, and we'll see that here in just a second. But man, I found some cool stuff. Uh, the learner support is, how do you allow for kids to talk back? Do you put something out there um, in your classroom that they can drop into, you know, the, the area of, hey, do you, is there questions you need to ask? Go here. You know, that kind of thing. And then accessibility. Well, this one has to do with, and it's, it's such a subjective one. I kind of disagree with them, but it's the, what do you use uh, in your classroom, your online classroom that is available, that makes it available, accessible to people with special needs? Again, what I tell people to do in this particular section is in your online classroom. If you know that your students are going to be using Chrome or Firefox or, God help them, Internet Explorer, you just look it up. Look up and see what it says in Chrome and Firefox and Internet Explorer or Safari. Look up and see what the accessibility things are. Copy, paste. Just copy and paste it in. You got eight taken care of. Now, we do QM. We look at some classes from 
uh, Southwest Colorado E School. Now their classes are done in Schoology. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter because we're looking at them through the lens of the QM. And they did. A, I don't know what happened, but they dropped off the map with the way to get into it. But here's the new directions on how to get into it. You'll go in. You'll look for a course. Uh, and then you'll do a QEM. In other words, you'll actually do a, a draft document. Try looking at it and look, looking through these courses that these people have created. And you go through the QEM and you go, do I see a one? I see the one, but I scored as a three. You know, how would I, how would I score it? Here we go. Here's, here's the meat. Google Classroom. This is what we'll end up using. Um, if you don't have a Google Classroom, we'll make one. Uh, I've got all the information you need to know. Here's the new version of Google Classroom. But let me show you what else is in here. This is the uh, way to become a Google certified teacher. If you're not, think about doing it. It's not that hard. Um, I sat with my PhD student and we sat in my office for two hours for a week. And we did it together and we got it done. That's how easy. But look down here, 50 awesome applications that integrate with Google Classroom. There is so much stuff now that you can put into Google Classroom. It's one of my faves right here, good old Buncee, uh, that you can then bring. Oh, look at that. Discovery Education's in Google Classroom now. Edpuzzle is in Google Classroom now. There's a lot of stuff in here that we have played with. Look at that. If you're a math teacher, go crazy. GeoGerba is in here. I just can't. It just is amazing what all is now available. Nearpod is, can come through. Padlet can come through. Pear Deck can come through. All of these different tools can come through. Now, I'm not going to say you must put five tools. No. I'm going to let you play and find something in here that makes you just go wow and put that in the other thing i'm going to put in oh here's the there's a google classroom pinterest uh, now uh and then the other thing we'll talk about i'm going to walk you through this by the way the other thing is uh i have been researching if you want to have that ability to have the kind of stuff that is interactive so like if you want to put in a fet P-H-E-T simulation into your Google Classroom. Well, you can put it in through a link or you can put it in through creating a Google site, have the Google site linked to your classroom so that when kids go to the Google site, there it is in its full glory. They can play in it um, and they can uh, experience it. And then they just, it's just a pop back over into the Google Classroom where you've got a comment waiting for them a place for them to comment back into the assignment. And the last one we will do is obviously the final. And as I said, the final is very straightforward. It is you developing your own Google Classroom and then you grading it using the uh, QM. In the I've got live text all set up. And in the live text, what I did is I've got this sitting in there. In other words, this form is sitting in there and you can actually just do it within the live text if you want to. Notice below each one of the standards, there's a reflection box. And that reflection box is where you put down, I gave myself a three because I feel like that the learning objectives represent what I teach and they're very easy to see very clear, uh, very simple for kids to get to. So you're going to be going through and doing that. This is also your opportunity to say, I don't think that the course technology besides, you know, all I did is I just, they're using Google Classroom. And so maybe I might give myself a two on that or a one. And that's fine. That is your professional judgment. And in the... Um, In the live text, this document is in there as a Word document as well. So if you're more comfortable with working with it as a Word document, because you don't have live text to do this, it can be really screwy. You could just pull up the Word document 
um, complete it, save it, and then post it back into the live text as, as an attachment. And that would be just funky dory as far as I'm concerned. So there we are. We just ran through it. As I said, to me, most of this is very straightforward. You're going to have me holding hands. I think the stuff that I'm very excited about uh, is helping you see the knowledge building principles. Uh, because, like, you know, uh, do, they, do they hold water? Do they have weight? You betcha. Uh, I find it so funny that something that I started working with 20 years ago, 20 years ago, is now coming back and being called things like deep learning. Uh, kids taking ownership of their learning. And I just kind of smile because we were talking about all this 20 years ago uh, in Jefferson County Public Schools, by the way. This wasn't something just going on in Toronto, Canada. We were talking about this in Jefferson County Public Schools. We were talking about this out in California. We were talking about it down in the Nashville Public Schools, uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa Public Schools, uh, Indianapolis. In other words, this is not a flash in the pan kind of thing. It's been around for a long time. Marlene and Carl have kind of backed off on the, um, the work, mainly because, you know, they're getting old. <laughs> I think Carl is now 83, and Marlene is pretty close. She might be a little older than me. Um, and they've, they've kind of scaled back because other people – have taken up the reins. Uh, Sandy McAlty, who teaches up in Prince Edward Isle, good friend Terry Anderson, whose stuff you're going to be reading, and other folks, they are kind of taking up the mantle of all this. But then the part that I'm very excited about to work with you with is the Google Classroom. I think what I like about what Google Classroom has become is the simplicity of it, the fact that school districts all over the Commonwealth, in fact, the entire Commonwealth of Kentucky, has now bought into it, and the fact that it is such a simple, open format for you to play within. When I used to teach this course with Schoology and Blackboard, uh, the thing that people complained the most about was, was how complicated they were. And they're right. I mean, look, look at our course. I mean, I, I try to make it as simple as possible, but it's still, it, it's, if you've never taken a Blackboard course, it's almost like you need to take a course before you take the course because it's so complex. But Classroom is so simple. Uh, and the other thing I like about it is because it isn't as separated out like Blackboard and School GR. In other words, you can literally have an assignment there that kids go in, complete, and it shows up in the teacher's uh, assignment uh, area that they see. Okay. I think I've said enough. I know you're, are you still here with me, Britt? Yep, Britt's still with me. Is there okay. anything, is there anything I failed to go over, dear? Have I made it fairly clear? I mean, I, you know, we're going to have to go into each of the modules become really clear. Oh, yeah, that was a good overview. Okay, so you could see the flow. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. All right, dear. Um, one, one as always. For you. Um, I, sure. I I've already been through module one because I'm the overachiever that I am, and yeah. <laughs> and I already took the quiz, but I'm worried since you've kind of been rebuilding things that it might have gone away. So no. is, is it? Did yeah. you get that result? Okay. Yeah. And you're fine, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Miss Perfectionist, you're fine. Oh, I know. Anyway. I was like, I, I knew why we were doing it, so I wasn't concerned about the score. I just want to make sure that the result was still there. So. And what I do is for that in the live text at Module 1, I just go in there. Uh, so if you want to go in the Module 1 right now and go ahead and say, I've done this, you know, and, and kick it over to where I can grade it, um, I go in and basically say, here's the grade based on what I see in the live in the blackboard because you can't do it in from a live text from blackboard to live text okay so the, the owner of the class in blackboard basically has to go in and say here's the grade that it reports out blah 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 um, I spent this summer working as hard as I could to figure out how to a automate blackboards grading and then B 
automate it so it would dump it over into live text. And I finally gave up. Boy, did I get in trouble because when I would automate it, it would go through and it would put the wrong scores in for people. And this was not this was a big class of people who don't know me. Right. They don't know that I'm on their side, <laughs> that if I make a mistake, I'm going to fix it right away. So I, I basically just had to drop it all and say, screw this, you know, and I said, don't worry, don't worry. It'll be fine. OK, my friend, you know, and I'll say this again, as always, everybody knows this. You 502-457-2937. Just yell. Uh, text me. Uh, you'll get an answer right away. By the way, if you need to text me while I'm out of town next week, you'll still get an answer because I'll have my phone with me. And we won't meet next week here. We will meet the week after that. Uh, I'll give a nod and a wave at Module 1 when we get together. But we'll dive deep into Module 2 because Terry Anderson has a lot to show us there along with the whole other pieces that have to do with paradigm shifts. Uh, Joel has a lot of good stuff to share with us. Joel Barker, uh, the videos, uh, the videos are pretty cool, actually. And then, of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Abbott and his stuff on constructivism. Okay, I'm going to call to halt. Take care of that little baby for me. Will do. Thanks, Steve. See ya. <laughs> Bye.